Hello, my name is Ollie Bliss and this is my channel Book Draw. For those who don't know, I enjoy looking at queer fiction and occasionally I create images out of it. Today I'm doing a wrap up from my reading through February. So this is just a list of all the books which I've read and a little synopsis or summary of the things that I enjoyed about each of them. Starting with A Simple Favour by Darcy Bell. Now I really enjoyed the film for this one and um, this is how I was introduced that this was even a novel in the first place. Um, and I love watching Anna Kendrick in all the things that she's done and she did not disappoint in this. Um, I just found it really fun, mysterious, um, playful and a little bit like quirky and different. Basically, Anna Kendrick's character is Stephanie who is a bit of a super mum. She is described in the book as Captain Mum because she is that mum who is super organised, she's on top of everything but she does it with meticulous detail and she um, writes a blog um, in the book about her experiences as a mum and she's kind of telling her audience what has been happening to her through the, the, through the process of her blog. In the film it's done through a vlog which is very effective in the same way um, and in the story it flips between characters perspectives um, whereas through the uh, film you are predominantly focusing on the experiences of Stephanie. But so Stephanie is introduced to Emily and Emily is um, uh, a, like a power mum, she's a, a boss mum, she's super cool um, and she's like the head of the PR in uh, a fashion company and um, she <laughs> probably drinks a little bit too much um, and she has a very kind of cavalier attitude um, but she loves her, her kid and is super supportive of him. Basically their kids form a friendship and that introduces them together and they form a fond friendship and Stephanie is asked just to pick up her, her, her kids for her and then just mysteriously disappears. And the focus of the story is unlocking the, the mystery that uh, behind her disappearance and everything that happens to her. Uh, it's really witty, it's really funny. Um, it's not one of those things where you can split and say, I preferred the film or I preferred the book because there are elements in the book which I preferred and there are elements in the film which I preferred. And it's very interesting how um, the tr they treat uh, Emily's husband uh, in both the book and the film and his character and just how they treat each other is different um, in, in both the film and the book. But there are things which I liked and disliked in both. <laughs> so I don't want to spoil anything, but basically it's interesting to read and watch the, the film. The next one is a really short one, which I just uh, read through my local library on Borrowbox. And um, it's just an hour and a half of listening to Ali Lama's Appeal to the World. So this was done by Franz Oh and uh, it's just a kind of a reflection on some major themes of the Dalai Lama and his discussion around secular ethics, which is like the dominant focus of what he's saying. And um, what I really liked about uh, the way he described secular ethics is it's very holistic and it's very open um, to a lot of different interpretation and it just provides the opportunity to experience a range of voices and a range of principles in terms of thinking about logic, thinking about empathy, um, thinking about uh, morality and philosophy and it just looks at exploring and combining or just having a discussion between those things. But you also get a slice of the Dalai Lama's personality, um, his sense of humour, uh, his, um, his mission in life and it just kind of gives you a way in. Uh, I. I think the re main reason why I read this is par partially because of the Hyperion Cantos because it kind of talks about um, the Dalai Lama and uh, his involvement in religion and philosophy and how that informs what happens in uh, the second two parts um, of the Hyperion Cantos. I took some of the things, the principles behind it uh, to heart in both the Hyperion Cantos and in this, um, uh, regardless of if you're a religious person, there are things and principles within this which you are likely to identify with and want to encourage in the world because it's just about kind of treating each other kindly and nicely. But it is like a, an encouraging, hopeful step to a more welcoming and um, positive future. The next one which I want to talk about and the next couple of ones which I'll be talking about are all related to series which I have been um, chipping into. So the first one is Awaken Online which is by Travis Bagwell. This is picking up from the story from the, the previous two. This is the third in a row. There is uh, a couple of side shoot storylines which I have not bothered to read yet but I would heavily encourage anyone who is struggling to get kids to read to pick this up and read it because 
it is a fantastic adventure and it's really relevant to right now in terms of you've got a young guy called Jason who um, has issues in his personal life, has issues in his virtual life and it's about how these two areas combine and impact on his reality and world. The story uh, uh, is really expanding now in terms of the wider universe of what, how uh, Jason is interacting in, in his virtual life and his uh, current life is getting a lot more complicated uh, structurally and that really intrigues me in terms of the direction of travel for this whole saga. I don't know how many books are going to be in this series in scale of this book. I just, I, I really appreciate everything that <laughs> I've experienced through this book. The next one, which I've also read, is which is part of a series. Now, this is the second book from, uh, from the initial uh, A Cruel Prince. This is now A Wicked King, uh, which is by Holly Black. So this is focusing on Jude, and Jude is a character who I'm falling more and more in love with. I think she's brilliant because Partly, um, she's a flawed type kind of character in a multiple different ways. Like, she is stubborn and competitive, um, but she's also tenacious and ruthless and really passionate about what she tries to achieve. Uh, she's put upon by the world of the elves, and she's trying to navigate this space as a mortal being, which is incredibly difficult. And she's taking on this real role in terms of her leadership and her cunning. Um, and she's doing things which are very morally ambiguous and it's very kind of grey, you're not sure um, if you should be supporting her or not throughout this book and I, I really like that because she's not a clean cut character but she has a small amount of influence in it and she really uses and draws on her strengths and I think that's a really brilliant part of the, the whole series of this and I'm very excited to see what happens to her next. And then <laughs> another a uh, book which I read which is also part of the series and I hope there is going to be a third book. This is the second book. So first there was A Gentleman's Guide to Vice and Virtue whereas this is the second book focusing on Monty's sister Felicity who is amazing <laughs> and this is called uh, A Lady's Guide to Petticoats and Piracy. So Felicity is a uh, proper geek. She loves um, her nose in a book. She's obsessed with becoming a, a surgeon. She's in a climate and a period of time where um, I think it's like the 1500s um, so there's lots of uh, pirate ships and things going on. <laughs> um, the state of the NHS is non-existent. There are only male doctors and practicing surgeons um, like through universities. She has very limited access to training other than her textbooks and she's really trying to find a way to progress her career. Um, it's partly also about her stubbornness and her her isolation that she's experienced because she's basically been looking after herself throughout her entire life and it, it's about her awakening to the possibility of actually um, drawing from her friendships um, and how they can support and enable her to get to her, her goals in a different way. It's also really interesting in terms of um, the reasons and motives why the writer wrote it, um, uh, which is explored at right at the end of the book, in terms of her comparing uh, different key characters, and I might explore that a little bit more in detail. What I thought was slightly odd is that the um, cover character does not re necessarily reflect what is described through the narrative, so I think I'm going to unpack that in a separate video, so you'll have to come back and check that out. There were a few kind of issues for me in terms of, um, again, describing um, the world around her, which was what I experienced with The Gentleman's Guide to Vice and Virtue. I just felt Europe's such a beautiful and rich um, place. And Felicity actually goes uh, beyond Europe as well. She explores uh, wider areas. And I just felt there was more opportunity to just give us a sense of that time and space. And it's really only light touch um, in terms of the way it looks at it and explores it. And I know it's a, a YA novel and that's not the dominant focus, but I just felt like it was a bit lazy in terms of like you could describe the situation a little bit more and she didn't give much really. Um, and in terms of a representation, um, uh, she's, um, she, she, does, she isn't explicit about her sexual identity, but it does explore it in the narrative in terms of her relationship with men and women and how she doesn't necessarily have either romantic or sexual um, desire for other people and she's much more focused on herself and her goals. So I just quite liked it, quite enjoyed it. Um, it's not the best read in the world but it is good fun.
The next one which I want to discuss is The Song of Achilles by Madeline Miller. Now, I did this as a buddy read with the wonderful Michelle over at Challenge Thy Shelf and the wonderful Amelia Root, uh, who is a fierce commenter and uh, really supportive within the booktube community, so send her a lot of love. Happy birthday! <laughs> um, because uh, she recently had one. I really enjoyed the um, buddy read with these two. I definitely don't think I would have actually completed this book without um, being kind of encouraged by the pair of them. I mean, none of us were like overwhelmed by this book, uh, which was really, really surprising because I have like observed a lot of love for this book over the booktube community. And I was just kind of really disappointed actually that I couldn't get there. Uh, Patroclus is growing up something happens to him which makes he it ends up being transferred and moves into the same situation as Achilles they form a strong brotherly bond early on they then go away and they are trained by a senator who um kind of passes on these little prophecies to each of them and it's about um Achilles having to make um very careful decisions about who he aligns himself with because he has this bigger prophecy about him being able to win the, uh, the war of Troy and you've got Patroclus who is encouraged to um, really fight for what he believes in and not to give away things um, so easily. Um, Michelle described it in the best way I think like she said it's like a really easy read but it's also colourless and dull and I was like yeah that that is exactly the experience that I am having with this right now like the pace is all there and there's enough things which keep you going and interested in what's happening but it, like it sparks no joy <laughs> it sparks no joy and I just felt quite limited by it I would say you also have to have a bit of knowledge in terms of understanding Greek mythology this this book is cool in terms of like you learn more about wider mythology I didn't know anything about Achilles man Theseus and she's a bit of the uh, antagonist within the storyline so those elements were interesting. I did like that um, Madeline Miller provided perspectives of what it's like for women in wartime during this period and she really created a landscape of empathy which have like zero control in that situation. I kind of liked it for that level but also I didn't feel like it did much. It could have just done it better or differently and I was really aware that it took her 10 years to write this thing and I was like I just, I just didn't, didn't get it. Didn't necessarily believe uh, the romance or the, the focus uh, um, uh, in which that she described their love for each other and their fondness. It, it didn't come across very authentically for me. So the next one which I'm going to talk about is why I'm no longer talking to white people about race, which is by Rennie Edo Lodge. Um, so this is starting off from a blog post which was back in 2014. This is a collection of her reflections. Um, so she starts off by looking at kind of the historic structural issues which have led to an absence of consequences for uh, white people and how they gain privilege through that process and how that has excluded um, uh, uh, black people and uh, people of colour uh, and just enabled white people to benefit from that situation. It's not confrontational, it is frank, it is critical and it is questioning um, and it's presenting a range of issues in a very clear way and actually it's backed up with evidence behind it and she's just kind of going these are my thoughts, this is the situation, uh, do you want to do something about it, do you want to explore this further, um, I'm not making any demands of you, I would just like you to be aware of this and be considerate of this. And I thought she just framed it in a really intelligent light touch way which just gives you the opportunity to gain a perspective of what it's like to be a black person. Um, she does um, focus then on to what it would be like to be um, uh, a black woman um, or a woman of colour and how that again can like add another level of um, <laughs> and how that can add another level of barriers in place which just exclude and marginalise you and uh, she's just encouraging a conversation really for anybody if there's lots of things that you can gain from this um, and I have just found it educational and useful to learn about um, 
and just take stock of, basically. So the next one which I want to talk about is Pulp, which is by Robin Talley. Now I have done a little bit of a, a talk about this in my previous video. Really enjoyed this book. It's focusing on 1955 through the lens of Janet, and it then leaps forward uh, 62 years to 2017 through the perspective of Abby. Um, there is the connecting theme of uh, lesbian fiction, the pulp fiction, um, and it's about what it's like to write that style of writing in, during the 1950s, and then it's taking a comparative look at what it's like for Abby drawing on the material from the 1950s, reflecting about where she is as a young person uh, living in America as a lesbian, um, and how that compares. I really like the kind of domestic um, issues that she's going through in terms of her relationship with her family and the relationship with her friend in terms of Abby, and also with Janet, but in a very different way. And it's interesting, again, in terms of the attitudes that everybody has, in terms of those things which are external to them as um, lesbian women living at that time, and the type of conflicts that they both engage with. I thought it was a very clear and interesting reflection on the progression that we've made, and it actually felt quite optimistic. Um, I think it's just a fun book. Uh, I would also encourage people to go out and go and check Jen Gallagher's channel, because she talked about it in a bit more detail. And also she refers to some other um, queer-related books, which are kind of positive and hopeful. And the next one which I want to discuss is And the Ocean Was Our Sky, which is by Patrick Ness. So this is an illustrated kind of novella. The pictures are really beautiful throughout the book. Um, uh, and it's like a, a spin on Moby Dick. So um, with Moby Dick, you've got a ship uh, which is chasing after a whale. In this, you've got the whales which are chasing after the ship. Um, and we follow, instead of through the um, perspective of Ishmael, we are following the perspective of Bathsheba. Um, and uh, instead of chasing Moby Dick, we are chasing Toby Wick. Uh, but really, I felt like this book was an exploration of man's greed. It's quite short, quite light. Uh, it didn't have a massive impression on me, but it is an interesting and, uh, journey, and it's nicely kind of put together. Um, so it's, it's, it's cool. <laughs> so those are all uh, my books which I have read during the month of February. If you have read any of these, please let me know what your thoughts and feelings are about them. I'd love to enter into a conversation with you. If you've enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe because that helps. Uh, and I will see you all again real soon. Okay, bye!